I think about it, and of course, and you know, we're all pretty close all these years, and I, I didn't even think about ministers. How many ministers have friends for like 30 years, you know? I mean, you get around 10, you, you need to get some new friends, you know? But in ministry, you know, we've been, of course, of course, Annette, of course, I've been stayed at their house how many times, and guys, I've had a lot of fun, but, but it's right, you know, just, and I just said a, a quote I'd heard, it just says, you know, until people know how much you care, they don't really care how much you know, and, and uh, what Rod, what Rod was teaching about, I thought I, I guide my, my my church by it, and I've been pastoring for just about 29 years uh, in Burgess, Minnesota, and uh, just the other day I was at the hospital. A little girl had some physical stuff wrong with her, and and she um, and finally went to the hospital. I'd been up there a couple times, and, and uh, she had she just got out of surgery and just real quiet, wouldn't talk, wouldn't eat, wouldn't. I mean, almost obnoxious. She would she wouldn't say nothing to nobody. Well. I just took after the service, after, after surgery, I thought, well, we'll just leave her alone. And I came back Monday for this one purpose. She's going to talk to me, you know. And I'm, I'm into my kids, you know. I, I spend a lot of time with our young kids and our youth. Actually, I'm doing youth right now. Our youth leader had, had moved on to another town. And, and when Rob was saying that, I thought, yeah, here I am. You know, 29 years, I'm doing youth. But, you know, they say this, we love Pastor. He is so much fun, he's crazy. They come up, yeah, he's... I mean, we, we play games. We're screaming so loud. And, but anyhow, I went to this, back to the hospital Monday, and this little girl, she was just, I'd been out of surgery about three days and wouldn't even hardly walk. And I tell you, by the time I left, this gal was talking. And this nurse came in. She said, you know, that's the first words I've heard. He said, she's talked, and, and, and you came up and you started talking. Well, that's because a result of being involved in, in your people. And so I'm not going to want to preach what Rod Rod is preaching on, but he's so right. You've got to. People just don't, and that's adults, they don't care what you know, and they know, they know how much you care for what you got. Well, um, I'm going to be talking about following your, your call for your life and, and your ministry, and it's important when we look at ourselves, you know, about this, you know, what God has called you to do and, and not someone else. And I think over the years, you know, people, we've tried to copy everybody from Mac Hammond to Brother Haig and all these things. You know, they, they do good things, you know, and they, they taught us a lot of things. I mean, I, I've learned a lot from from different ministries, but God hasn't called us to be like someone else. And I begin to look at this here more and more, of course, you know, they, uh, I mean, think about, we're, we're unique to God, and I, it took me a while to really get that in my heart, that I am really unique to God. There's not two Larrys, and maybe some of you'd say, thank God for that, you know. <laughs> but it's true, you know, we are unique to God. Each and every one of us here in this building, people are listening, we think about that, you know, we have different strengths. And I, we have different, different graces and, and different gifts. And I, I think about, you know, just like, like I just give an example for Rod. He's always been happy, you know. I mean, there's, there, I mean even, even when he's, things are going bad, he, he, he's, got to, he's got such a gift to just to be happy all the time and be positive. But looking at this here, you see, you know, others can help us, you know, by, by their example of life. And thank God for that. But just because someone else is doing something or has done something that appears to be successful, think about it. Doesn't mean, we, doesn't mean we should all be doing it. You know, I got caught up in that early in ministry. You know, I'd go to meetings, you know, and of course we'd, we had 20 people in the church, you know, and you get all, people have all these big programs. And I thought I had to go home and do that, you know. Here I got 20 people, you know, and I mean, they're exhausted, you know, by the end of the month because pastors, you got to do this. I heard this in a meeting and then it works. And my whole thought is this, you know, when you think about that, God said we're not trying to, we're not to try to copy anybody. And so when I'm thinking about this meeting here, or this today, you know, of course, I mean, I'm thinking about I had gotten worn out and trying to do good. Then one day the Lord spoke to me, and so clear years ago, and he said this, he said, who told you you had to do all that stuff? And it was just so clear in my heart when he says, not me. I'm looking back from that day to this day, and I can really tell you that all these years, I mean, I have enjoyed ministry. I, I rest in ministry. I enjoy what I'm doing. I haven't not any complaints about being called a pastor, you know. And I think about it, I really do love it. And I think about it even now this year, I mean, I mean now these, these years, at 29 years in one church, I mean, think, well, do you ever get tired of going to, going to church? I never get tired of it. I enjoy what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. But here's the thought. I'm not trying to copy anybody else. And so the message today we're talking about is just following your plan for God, not trying to follow someone else's. Now, we'll turn over to the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12. And, of course, you know, years ago, you know, they, especially Brother Jim Casey, he must have taught five years about the body of Christ. You know, it seemed like every time you go someplace, 
I used to think, I wonder if he knows anything else, you know. But I, it wasn't that he didn't know anything else. Is that we needed to know, we needed to get this in our heart, you know, about the body and how it, how it works. And so looking at this, he, he goes on and he says in 1 Corinthians 12, the 18th verse, and this is what it is. God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as he wished and, and uh, let's see, and uh, saw fit with the best adaptation. And when I begin to see this, you know, you think about this in the body of Christ, we as ministers, you know, God has, you see, you've got to uh, realize that God has placed us where he wants us to be, you know, each with a special and unique, you might say, gift and calling of God. Now look at about this here, with different callings, you know, with different locations, with different people, with different needs and different personalities, but all need to be handled a little differently. And I was just thinking about this when putting this together, you know, today that no one minister has it all. We got, we got, we're in different locations with, with different people that require different things. You know, I've been like, like Pastor Rod was talking about, we've gone to seminars and I hear about big churches. And I mean, thank God for big churches. But you know, the average church in the United States is 65 people. 65 people, that was a few years ago. And I think the way things are going nowadays, it's probably less than that. It's probably under 65. But as we begin to look at this, you think a big city requires different things. Little cities require different things. Well, I'm in more of a rural area that requires different things. But now even, even we're hearing up north, home church is popping up, which God has called people to them, you know. I, I, I know one pastor, he says, I got three churches. One is 15 people, one is 10 people, another is like 25. And I thought, isn't this something? See, we, we, we couldn't all have the same grace. We couldn't have all the same calling to, to minister all those different needs. Now, looking at this here, I learned quickly, you know, really where I'm at. I'm kind of like in a farmland USA up there, you know. It, it's a, a lot of tourism. and, and uh, uh, But these people, they don't like to go in places. I mean, to go to Fargo could be an over, mean an overnight stay for 50 miles, you know. <laughs> I mean, you'll say you want to go out and have dinner, and they'll say, why don't we just stay home and have lunch, you know? And we're, what I'm saying is that everything requires different, different gifts, different graces, and, and, and different, different needs. And, of course, looking at a pastor talking about following our call, you know, we gotta, we, we've got we to gotta follow what God has called us to do. Now, every conference you go to, you know, they're a little different. I, I, I go to two or three maybe different conferences a year. I, of course, I always come to AFCM's conference and stuff, but I've gone to a couple other ones, and something that I, that I, I, I noticed here, we're about, uh, we're, we're altar calls are given for people who are just exhausted and worn out and want to quit. And two years ago, I was at a conference, and it was a bigger conference, and there, there, there was an altar call, and they said, we're, we just feel in our heart we need to pray for people that have just are, are ready to quit. If God doesn't do something, we're done. You know what happens? About a quarter to a third of the group stand up to get prayed for. And with my heart in this message, I, th I just, it just should not be that way. And you wonder, why is it that way? Why does somebody get up and, and we just, I, I'd be honest with you, even when I, I did leave my church for six months over some personal problems, I, I, ne I, never, I, never, uh, I, never, I never was tired. I never was exhausted. I never wanted to leave. In my particular situation, I had to leave for a while just to get out. But the thought is it shouldn't be that way. That just people just being so exhausted and so tired, we should really love what we're doing. Because if you don't love what you're doing, pretty soon you're going to grow old and it's going to get tired and you're not going to want to do it anymore. Now, see, I've been up to 20, 29 years in this one church and I get people all the time. Actually, I'm the oldest pastor in the area now. And I get people all the time that say, 29 years? Aren't you tired of this people? Aren't you tired? Of no, I, I tell you, I got to the point I love them so much I can't, stand, I can't not be around them. I... I preach to other churches around our area, you know, and uh, I mean, it's different. You know, the word, this word of faith message is a different deal. I preached in Methodist churches. I preached in Baptist churches. We have a, a tight knit of ministers that we trust one another, you know. I, I mean, the message I preach, I know they didn't like, you know, <laughs> about faith and about, you know, God's victory. But the fact of it is, it's, it's different than my church, my home church. I love it, and, and it should be a, 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 fa a family should be, it should be like their homes and our family. It shouldn't be any different than that, that we, we want to be there and we want to do it. 
Now, we'll turn over to the book of Philippians. Just a, another scripture. You only got three scriptures or four. But in, with, this minute, with this thought in mind, following God's plan for your life, it says, um, Paul says in, in Philippians 1, 6, it says, For I am convinced, and I am sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return. He says, developing it, that good work, and perfecting and bringing in full completion in you. Now, looking at this here, I had, I had another translation. I don't have it with me. I wrote it down, but it says, he said he's going to keep, keep working on this plan, on, on this calling until the task within you is finally finished. Meaning this is that we all have a call of God. God has put things within us, strengths and gifts, you know, and uh, uh, personalities that, 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 that fit exactly where God wants us to be. He says, I, God has called you and he has put you exactly where you fit. But here we're here thinking about this here. This call of a pastor is a good call, amen. I mean, I pastored for years now and you say, well, have you never had any problems? You had a lot of problems. But I do know this, is that, is that when we know where we're, when we're, when we're where God wants us to be, no matter what comes up, I know God's going to get me through it. Amen. Now, think about this here. It's greater than most imagine or think. I mean, this pastoring, being a pastor, it, to me, I call it, look at it as a high calling of God. I look at it as a, a quality call that God looks at a man or woman's heart. And he knows exactly that, that you need to be in this spot. It's a big deal. It's so important, you think, that God says he's going to develop it. He's going to perfect it within us until the very day that we go on to heaven. Now, getting into where I'm talking about today, Brad sent out an email about this seminar. Of course, we, 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 we had gotten it and stuff. But he made a comment. He says, you know, there's going to be three successful ministers, you know, going to share at this conference. And, of course, I knew that he was one of the successful, successful ones was me, you see. But here's the thought. I got thinking about success. I really did. I got thinking, well, really, if I'm going to be a, if I'm going to go to this conference and be one of the successful ministers that he's talking about, I kind of got to ought to know what success is. And I'll tell you, I really, before God, I, I, I said, Father, I just, I just need to know what, what do you look at success in life? Because, you know, a lot of times we look at success a little different than God. And through my prayers, I I was sitting there one day and this just came out of my heart about success. He said, first thing is you need, to, you, need to, you need to be where I've called you to be. And he said, you need to do what I've called you to do. Now, let me tell you this. We, we rate sex a whole lot. We, we rate really success a whole lot different than God. We think, well, big buildings, you know, I mean, you've got the biggest church. And I mean, I used to go to conferences and they'd say, how big a building you got? How many, first, how many people come into church? Well, I felt bad. I had like 20, you know. And my building was just a rat trap. You've seen it, Rod. I was embarrassed to even invite my family down. They already thought I was nuts. <laughs> I mean, when I got saved and when I left Wilmer, they, I mean, I closed my business down. They already thought I was over the edge. So I thought, well, if I invite them to this dump I got now, you know, they're going to really think I was over the edge. But here's the thought. We look at success a whole lot different than God. And when God put it in my heart, he said, you know, Larry, he says the number one thing, he says, you've got to be where I've called you to be. And you've got to do what I've called you to do. And so when we're talking about this today, you know, I'm just looking at all this, you know, this minute, but that's for life or whatever. I've got a new youth, youth leader, he, well, a guy wants to be involved with the youth, and he was talking about all these great plans, you know, that he wants to do, you know. And I said, you just wait a minute here, I said, you know. I said, the first thing you gotta, you got to know within your heart, I said, this is what God has called you to do. If you're just going to try this out to please pastor or, or, or just fill the position so, so someone will do it, it ain't never going to work. You've got to be where God has called you to be. And I think about this here, you know, when I when this, this whole message here. Again, it doesn't have to do with size because then the big cities would be a whole lot better than us. It hasn't got to do with, con with, with the number of the churches because you had more people than someone else. That means you'd be more successful. But you see, what, what, if you had more money in the bank, I mean, I, I think about all these things. And, of course, when, when we were taught, Brad Rod said something about, 
you know, that you go to seminars and it was always for the bigger churches. And of course, I looked at myself as a loser, you know. I thought, man, I really feel where I, I'm supposed to be where I'm at. And I really, I really thought I'm doing what God's called me to do. But you know, I was looking at success the way the world looks at success. And God's success is a whole lot different than what the world's success is. Now turn over to the book of, uh, let's see here, uh, Romans 11th chapter. And I've pastored a long time now, you know, and I begin to look back. I used to have to use everyone else's jokes, you know, and illustrations. Now you can use your own, you know. <laughs> but when God put this on my heart about, about on this conference, and of course Brad said, what are you going to share on it? I said, well, following your plan, following God's plan for your life. And I tell you, the problem I see today is a lot of pastors trying to follow someone else's plan. I mean, the practical things that Pastor Rod was teaching about, I tell you, I implemented them. I mean, they are awesome. And the things that we, we, we can implement, we need to, we need to do, I mean, I, like I used to tell Rod, I said, after the service, I said, that was awesome. I said, because you don't pastor all the people. You're not, well, when they grow up, those little ones are going to be gone. They got to know that, that their pastor loves them. They got to know their pastor's there for them. You got to pastor all of them. Now, looking at this here over in Romans, the Romans 11th chapter, again, about following your call. Over Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. It says, for the gifts and his calls are irrevocable. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But he said he never withdraws them when once they are given. And he does not change his mind about to those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Let I me mean, think about that, you know. I mean, I've had people call me and ask me about pastoring and how do you how do you get started? How do you how do you plan a church, you know? Well, usually the first thing I tell them is you better know for sure you you're 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 where God wants you to be. Because you're not where God wants you to be. I mean, no matter what you try to do isn't gonna work. Now, you got to know without a doubt. Now, pastoring can be the best, and pastoring can be the worst. I, I've had so many different situations. I've run into pastors, I just can't hardly stand this no more. I said, I've never been to the place where I can't stand it. But the fact is, I know where God wants me to be, you see. Now, looking at this here, you know, they, I think about uh, well, your dad, Jim. I, Jim, years ago, when he was even here in this church, remember when God told Jim a, a year before he left the church, and he said, well, we're getting a good check. You know, we got a place to live. First time we ever had a place to live. I think he was living in my trailer course then. That wasn't that great a place to live. <laughs> but I remember thinking about that. Jim says, you know, he said, God told me and Kathleen and our family to move to Oklahoma. And he said, we waited a year. He said, it was the toughest year of our life. But why was that? Jim Caseman, he's awesome. We love Jim. He's our pastor. I mean, he ministers all. Why would he have a bad year in ministry? not being what God wanted him to be, not doing what God had called him to do. Kenneth Hagin, I was looking at, a, reading a book here a while ago, and Kenneth Hagin was saying that, I don't know, when, when he was younger, he said that a certain group of people wanted Kenneth, the great Kenneth Hagin to, to, to pastor their church, and he said, well, Lord, he says, here's the deal. If they vote me in 100%, he said, I'm going to take that church, he says, and I'll pastor it. He left the church that was going well, he went to this other church because 100% voted him, and he says, that year was like hell. Now, we're talking about following your call. The area of success is being where God has called you to be and doing what God has called you to do. We have two examples of great men, you see. I mean, they've, they've done so much for God and will continue doing it, but when you get out of place or when you're not where, if you're not sure where you're supposed to be, this is what happens. The great success we think we have isn't so successful. Now, some of the, just looking at this here, again, I heard, I heard, a, I heard a, a saying that said, some are called, you know, some are sent, some just picked up their Bible and went. And I heard that back in Rhema years ago, and I thought, well, that's the way it was years ago. You know, that, I mean, there, we come out of Rhema, I thought, man, I just, I want to do anything for God, you know. But looking at this here, just because we, we just because we see a need doesn't mean we, we need to fill it. This message, you know, that when I look at it myself, I mean, I, I had uh, left my church for six months for personal reasons and stuff, and I, I, uh, 
I had, actually, I, I know my personality, so I didn't just go on a sabbatical. I, I resigned the church, trying to get some things together in my life and stuff. And uh, this was 15 years ago now and stuff. And one day, I, well, and I, of course, I had, you know, with AFCM, there's certain things they, they demanded of me and required I, I did, which was great. I'm glad it happened that way. But one day, I was going to Alexandria, Minnesota. I'll never forget it. And your dad called me. Of course, that's like Brother Hagin calling me on the phone, you know. <laughs> Jim Case, but man, you know. And uh, remember he talked to me a little bit. And he said, you know, Larry, he said, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. I had been out for about five months or whatever this was. And, and uh, he says, what do you feel God wants you to do? With it? You know, what do you feel God wants to do with your life? What do you feel God wants you to do? And I, I knew in my heart, you know, we, you know the, the church had a, uh, a pastor in there, well, he, they, they'd never given the church. He was in there filling the pulpit. And I said, you know, Jim, I just really feel God wants me to go back to Vergas. And, of course, like your dad does, he's going on. And, I, and he asked me again, you know, hey, Larry, i got to ask you again. What do you feel God wants you to do? And I said, well, I feel he wants me to go back to my church in Vergas. Well, talking again, and he asked me three times. And at the end, he said, you know what, he says, I'm going to remind you of that, he said, someday. He says, when the going gets tough, he says, he says, I want to know that you know in your heart that's where you're supposed to be. I went back to that church, you know, and of course, I don't know, I'm the first month, I'm the kid, and I, I could have left pretty easy again, you know. Half the church left, you know, and we had a lot of things. The finances went, oh, well, they went behind the eight ball, you know. And, but I kept thinking about this here. I knew where God called me to be. And I was doing what God called me to do. And that no matter what come up, I mean, hell came up. We had a lot of things come up, a lot of things had to change. You know, my, all my staff had left. My musicians had left. And that's the tough one, you know, because, man, it's tough to get musicians that you can, that, I mean, to get them focused, I think, is the biggest thing, you know. <laughs> Temporal and mental, you know. <laughs> well, Tom, we know that. So. But <laughs> what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that through it all, you know, if you don't know where you're called, where, where you're called to be, and you, you aren't sure about it, I tell you, being in the ministry is going to cause you a lot of trouble. I'm not saying quit your ministry and leave your ministry. I'm just saying that we, we, need, we need to be aware of what's going on within our life. But look at this scripture here again. It says, for, his, for God's gifts and his calls are irrevocable. And I think about that many times. You know, God's not going to change we don't like what we're doing, you know. We don't like the city we're in. We don't like the people we're in. God is going to change his call. God is going to say, well, because you don't like Wilmer, we're going to move you to St. Cloud. You don't like St. Cloud, we're going to move you someplace else. But he's going to, he says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. And I'll tell you why. I thought about this many times because of my heart. I love people. Of course, you guys know that. I love people. I love, I love ministering to people. I, when Rod was talking about about. Uh, 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 success or things to do in ministry to build a church. I, I, I got a group of guys down in McDonald's. I met them about five years ago, you know. And uh, I, I, these guys sit down at McDonald's and they talk all day long, every day. And then I got invited down there and I thought, I told the guy when I left, is this all you guys do? <laughs> I said, I mean, my life's more important than sitting down at McDonald's. But here, we, we, they talk about the same thing every day, you know. They know everything about everything, but they don't know anything. <laughs> and I started meeting up with these guys just because I like people. And I, I, started, I started coming down there like once a week. Then I got like once every two weeks and stuff. But I tell you what, I, I hooked up with them because I like people. And talking about your call, you know, your call isn't just inside your building. It's just amazing how that, these guys will call me. And you know how sometimes you don't even think you're really doing that good a job. You know, you think, ah, I don't even care if I come, you know. I come in at McDonald's one day. I hadn't been there for about three weeks because it's, it's brutal, you know, sitting down and talking every day. And uh, walked in, this guy says, oh, here's Pastor Larry. He said, are your ears itching? He said, I said, what's, what's going on? We're just talking about you. And this guy said, you know, Larry, he said, when I had surgery, he said, my pastor never came. You came. Now, through this group, I tell you, I, I guess when, why I'm throwing this out, I have no idea why, but, but uh, I've been able to pray for so many of these guys to be born again. I've, I've done weddings for their daughters and sons. I've been in the hospitals with these guys, and I tell you, it, it's, it's touched our church. These guys are coming to church, and they're, 
born again, you know, and they always say, well, so they'll come every Sunday and say, we need, we need a little tuna. That's what they say. <laughs> but looking at this thing about this call, you see, the call of God or these gifts of God, God said, I'm never going to take them back. If you're a pastor, that's your gift. I'm not taking that calling out of you. I'm not taking those gifts out of you. I'm not taking the anointing out of you. That's why I've called you to do it. And he says it's not irrevocable. He said, how did he go on? And he says that uh, he'll never withdraw them. And I thought, well, if God's not going to withdraw them, we've got to get with it, amen. I mean, no matter what's going on, if we know we're called there, God says, I'm not going to pull back. And here, I tell you, here's why. God knows our heart. And I got, that's about how I got off about people. God knows our heart. He knows the love you have for people. He knows the, how you care for people. He knows that how people are important to you, you know. God knows our heart. And he, God put that heart within us as pastors, you know. So when he says, I called you, I said, I put within you special qualities, you said, to pastor these people. And I'm not going to pull them back. I'm not, how did you say? He said, I'm not going to withdraw them. I'm, and uh, I'm not going to change my mind about it. To whom he gives his grace or whom he, who gives his calls, you see. See, the kind of God knows your heart. And even when I left that church and came back, I thought, man, this is some tough ground. It was tougher than when I started that church. Because people are judging you, you know, and I, my secretary said, you know, they, someone said this and someone said that. And I thought, oh, man, you know, you know Debbie, you know. And she'd been teaching children's church so long, so when she explained things, it's always like to an, a, a child, you know. And you know they said this and you know they said that. And, Funny, one day I said, listen, I tell you, I don't want to hear any more about it, but anyone said. I said, I, I know I'm supposed to be here. I'm going to do what called, God called me to do to the best of my ability. And I'll tell you, I look back now, oh, that's 15 years back. I thought, man, life is good. Life is just awesome, you know. And, but here's what, God knows our heart. How did he say he'll, he knows where you'll adapt? Remember over in 1 Corinthians, he knows where you'll adapt? God knows where we're going to fit best. God knew you'd, you'd, you'd fit here best, and you'd fit traveling ministry, and you'd pastor or wherever you'd be. God knows where we'll fit. On the street, out there teaching the word out there, you see, God knows where we'll fit because God knows our heart. I think about David over in Samuel where, where, uh, where um, David was chosen to be a king. Remember how they're going through, went through all the brothers, you know, and you say, no, nah, he's not it. He's not it. What did, what did it say? Samuel, uh, let me just go back here real quick. Samuel 16, and uh, right along the lines I'm talking here, look over here, it says that, uh, I'm trying to think here, uh, I'm trying to get the name here, all right. It, uh, yeah, over Samuel 16. Well, they were going through all these different, the different brothers and, and uh, and uh, was it Jesse? He said that, how about, how about this son? How about this son? How about this son? And look at verse 6. And this is the thing that has always interested me about the calls of God. You've got pastors, prophets, you've got evangelists, how that they're all so different. But this pastor gift is a special one because God trusts us with his family. God trusts us with his kids. And he says this here. He says, now, pastor, but the Lord, he said to Samuel, he said, he says, uh, but the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on the appearance or at his height of statue, for I have rejected all them then, the boys. He says, For the Lord looks, sees not as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but he says, But the Lord looks at the heart. Now think about this pastor's calling, you see, or any other calling. We're talking about pastors today. There was times I never felt qualified, you know. I thought there's got to be somebody more qualified than me, you know. I'm preaching and spitting on the front row, you know, and I have words I can't pronounce right and all this stuff, you know, talk too fast, you know. And I thought, thinking one day, Lord, there's got to be someone more qualified. But God spoke to my heart, no, Larry. He said, I called you here. I called you to Fergus, Minnesota, this little town with a handful of people. And, you know, one time we outgrew the town. But the fact of it is, is that, he says, God has called us and appointed us. He said, I, I put you where I want you to be. He said, well, you'll best adapt. Well, here, think about Samuel over here in David. David wasn't God. Really, you look at it, he wasn't more qualified than a brother. Actually, the brothers were, were more qualified than he was. They were smarter. They were bigger, you might say. They, they had more knowledge. But God says, I didn't look at the outward appearance. 
the reason I've called you where I've called you is because of your heart. And I think about that so many times now. I've always liked people. I mean, I worked in this church. I was here for seven years, you know. I've always loved people. And I thought, well, when God moved me out of here, you know, it was, I knew it was God. But I thought, why up there, you know? I mean, that, I don't even want to go up there, you know. You've seen the church, Rob. You, you helped me build it, you know. And, <laughs> I mean, and I got up there and I thought, how could you fall in love with this, you know? How could you even want to be up here? But I thought this here, God knew my heart. He knew that I'm going to put you up here. You're going to adapt good here. This is the spot I want you. And how do you know? Well, God looked at our heart. God knows our heart. And you think about it, you know, that he chose them all, David, over all the better qualified. See, when we know where God has called us, even when hard times, you say, might come, and they will, you won't have to wonder and ask, should I stay or should I leave? I had a, actually, I've got two situations. One, one I was a, a local pastor in Detroit Lakes. Great guy. Oh, man. This guy has got just a soft heart to people. And, well, when he took, he took over the church, he, he took over a church of a couple hundred people or whatever, I think it was like that, in, in, right, right up by my house. And we got to be pretty good friends. Actually, his, in, his in-laws come to my church. I thought when he came to town, they were going to bail too, you know. But they stayed with me, and of course, and we got to be good friends. And, well, in that church, you had a huge split. The church split right down the center. It was so bad. And he said, you know, Larry, well, I, actually, I was, I was going to work one day, and he stopped my car, and we got talking. And he said, you know, Larry, he says, I don't know what to do. He says, hey, our church is split down the center. He said, we don't have money to even pay me anymore. Here's what he said. He said, do you think I should leave or close this church? This is what I thought. I said, Tim, if you know for sure God has called you here, why would you or should you ever leave it? Let me tell you, talk about plowing ground. This guy had to get a job. He was embarrassed. I mean, he had, he had left the church where he had a full-time job, getting a salary, getting paid, moved down to, up to northern Minnesota, farmland USA out there, you know. He did, and he... He got there and the bottom fell out. But let me tell you about this here, guy. I said this to him. I said, you know, if you know for sure this is where God called you to be, why would you ever want to leave where God has you? I hear about three years later, they're building on this church. They're adding on the front of this thing. And it wasn't because he's so great, but because of this great God that knew where he could fit. You see, that's with us also. You see, when hard times come, if we aren't sure of, of our calling, we're not sure where we're supposed to be at, is when we want to leave, we want to give up, and we want to run. Had a guy one time, when he was my church, he called me, this is what he said. I won't tell you who it is. He says, uh, hey, Larry, if you ever leave that church, would you give me a call? I says, why? He says, well, I'd like to upgrade a little bit. My first thought, well, well, don't hold your breath, you know. But here's the thought, is that, we're getting, we're getting so many mentors to the, today. It's easy to pastor a church that's already, already, already set up for you. It's easy to, to, to go to when you're, when you're getting a paycheck. But you know what I find out this when you know it's God's call, it's easy wherever you go. We're getting so many ministers today out of place. We're getting people out of place. And you think about in the body of Christ today, I honestly think that if everyone would get back where they're supposed to be, Jesus probably would have came back yesterday. I run it up north. You'll have a you'll have a big church start and a new church. We had a new church start. Man, they were sucking people out of churches like a vacuum cleaner, you know. You know what? That church, it grew, took off, and pretty soon it just went back down to nothing. When you're out of place and you're not where you're supposed to be, is when you'll have a lot of a lot of trouble in life. Now, I had this book here that this I don't even know where I got it. You know, you get stuff in the mail and stuff and called uh, Pastors on Hell's Hit List. <laughs> I don't even know who wrote it, but, but it's a pretty good deal. I'll just read one, 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 one little paragraph. It says this. It says, worldly and carnal, carnal, it says, worldly and carnal, self-ambitious pastors need not fear. They can rest easy in the fact that there are no threat to hell. Well, you can turn, flip that corner on the other side when you are doing what God's called you to do. When you are where God wants you to be and you're doing the best you can, you are on hell's hit list. Then it goes on and says this. Uh, 
the devil may lead them in, in moral and, and failures for, uh, may, may lead them in, a, let's see, the devil may lead them in moral failures for, for the purpose of, of uh, speaking evil over the name of Christ, but it won't be because they're any danger to his kingdom. And see, there's a lot of ministers today, they're no danger to hell. Heck, he's got them right where he wants them to be, you know. You just relax, take it easy, don't do much, and surely don't, don't, don't be the pastor of everyone, you know. But he says this, but godly pastors are another story. The degree to which, you pass, which a pastor is living holy and righteous, you might say, and doing what God has called him to do, the enemy will feel compelled to silence his voice. But he says, nevertheless, we need not fear his schemes. We only need to understand his tactics and avoid his predictable traps. I, when, I, when I'm talking about this following your call, I, I tell you, I, I look at, at my life and you guys' life. Everybody, I mean, I know everyone here, mostly most everyone, that they're where God wants them to be. But if we're going to be successful, you see, it has nothing to do with how big a church we have or like that million-dollar sound system you're talking about some churches have. It has nothing to do with how many people you have. Because you look, in, 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 you look at some of these rural churches, they may have 10 people. You say, well, are they successful? If they're where God wants them to be. You look at a church, it could be 10,000. Are they successful? If the pastor's where he's supposed to be. And doing what God has called them to do. Now, I don't know where I, where I got this. I think this might have, I might have got this from Tim Gilligan. And I don't know if I give him credit or not, because I'm going to preach a little bit. Just a couple minutes about this success. You know, Tim is, Tim is excellent minister. I, I love listening to Tim, Tim's stuff. He's in our Bible school, and we've had that Bible school for years. But it's called the three, C's, the three C's for success. And he says, one is this, don't compare. We as ministers, especially pastors, don't get in the trap of comparing your life or your ministry or your people or your situation or your town with someone else. I just use me and Pastor Rod and Annette that what happens here or how they pastor their church here may not work where I'm at. The things they do here and the person, well, you think of different personalities. I mean, look at some of those I got up north there, you know. I mean, they got different personalities, you know. I mean, you, you see, you want to go to Fargo? Oh, I don't know. It's going to take an hour to get there. Well, you guys would jump in the car and drive to the cities, you know. What I'm saying is that we can't compare our, our, our church or our, our people or even our calls with someone else. We've got to be careful. We don't compare ourselves with someone else and say, well, Brad's doing better than me because he's doing this or Rod's doing this because, and that's better than me or you're doing this and that seems better than me. See, the, one of the seeds for success is don't compare. Another seed of success is just don't compete. And I, I, I like this because <laughs> I think about how much competition over the years, you know. We started this pastor's uh, uh, group up in Detroit Lakes years ago, and I tell you, when we first started, you, you walk in there, and for the first thing you, they'd say, well, they'd look at your car, and say, oh, you're driving a Cadillac, you know, and, or you're, you're driving this, or, and they, you know, of course, I didn't invite them to Burgess because that was such a dump up there. The church, we hadn't even started building the church. I was afraid to invite them up there, you know. But now here we've got a beautiful sanctuary now. We've got a beautiful church. We've got, I mean, God has blessed us beyond I can even imagine but here's the thought when you start com comparing and you start competing is when the tr when we run into trouble as ministers and I heard this message I don't know if it was preached in totality or how it was but I thought about this we're not we're not in this to build our own kingdom you see we're in this to build God's kingdom and so we look at the success don't start comparing I used to do that. I'd go to meetings. I'll tell you honest, sometimes I'd come home from the ministry, even in the meetings, I'd feel so bad. You walk at somebody and say, well, how big is your church? Remember years ago they always say, this? how many you got there? You know, I'd say, well, 20, you know. And, yeah, we got 70, you know. And I'd go like thinking, well, dear God, you got 70. I'm a loser, you know. But then it got to be the point that finally, finally, I mean, you tell somebody I got now, I got 50 or 51. And it got set to be a comparing, or such comparing was, 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 will pull us down. Competing is another one. We can't compete. We've got to be thankful for what God has got us. You know, I used to think when, well, when Brad asked me to work here, and Brad Patty actually, they, when I come out of Raymond, they asked me, when he came down and asked me about working for in the church, I was so thankful that God would have me do anything. I thought for the way I lived my life and the way I, the way I was raised and the way, the way I, I mean, I lived for the devil for 30 years, I thought, just for God to use me. I had to get on my hands and knees and thank the Lord Jesus for using me. 
And I think that's where pastors, and we talk in the pastor, they all ministry, you know, I'm looking out here at the world. Instead of, instead of comparing, competing, we ought to be thankful for what God can use us with. And the last thing was complaining, of course. Glad to touch on that. The three C's, don't compare, don't compete, and stop complaining. Be thankful that God can, can, can use us for anything. Follow in his plan for our lives. The last scripture is 1 Samuel 30. It's just something that, you know, you know there's something to, to help us all. Sam, David lost everything. Of course, David was out in war, and David came back, and uh, the whole village was, was, was destroyed. Uh, they lost everything he had, the animals, and this is all of his wives. I mean, I think one would be enough, but he lost them all. <laughs> Thank God for wives, but <laughs> I lost them all. But anyhow, but David lost everything he had. And uh, if you look at it, I mean, it said he was so depressed. He said he, he, was, he was, how did it say he was just weeping in, in sorrow? But look at verse 6 says, but David encouraged, encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord. And I think about that many times. We as pastors, you know, that rather than take a whip and matter look at a bad day and, and get down on ourselves, well, David said he encouraged himself. Now, here's a thought. We're so good at encouraging everyone else. Why don't we use that great faith we teach everybody about? Encourage ourselves. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's nothing impossible for me that, 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 that trust God. You think about that. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. And my favorite scripture is over in Romans where he says that all things will work together for good. To him that love God and are called according to his purpose and plan for their life. I heard a story. I'll close right here. I heard a story about this pastor at 60 years they pat him and his wife had pastored for 60 years, and, and they retired. And when he was retiring, one day he was home, and he said he was going through the closet. And he found a, a shoebox with three eggs in it and 100 $1 bills. And he's looking at this box, and he told his wife, honey, what is this box all about? She says, well, honey, you know, she said, every time you preached a bad message, I put one egg inside that box. Yeah, he got thinking, three eggs, three bad messages and in 60 years. She said, oh, she says, then when I got a dozen eggs, she said, I sold them for a dollar. <laughs> Here's a thought. <laughs> We're not always going to do everything right. We're not always going to have the best message. But when we are where God wants us to be, God will call that bad message and cause those things that we didn't do right to be perfected. Ministry is the best. It is awesome. I, I tell you with myself, I, I think about it all these years. I, I'll be 70 in just about two weeks. And uh, I can't find one thing to complain about. Do you have bad days? Yeah, I got bad days. I got to go back now and straighten the guy out in church now when I get home, you see. But I think about this. That's part of the grace and that's part of the gift. That's part of what God has called us to do, to, to lead and shepherd people. You, you can do it the right way, a good way. But when you, know, when, you know, when you know that you know that you are where God has called you to be and you're doing to the best of your ability what God has called you to do, you know, we should be so thankful and resting in the hope and the faith in God that he'll get you through it. He'll make a bad thing good. Glory to God. He'll make that bad message sometimes. I mean, there's a few times I've been thinking, dear Lord, when have I got anything out of that? And then someone walks up and says, man, that was good, Pastor. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I get a little bit scared thinking, you thought that was good? You know? <laughs> but here's the thought. Again, being where God has called you to be and doing what God has called you to do, you'll be the most successful person that you could be for God. Boy, that's tough to finish on time, too, I'll tell you that. I love you guys. Again, Brad, thanks, uh, thanks Patty, for letting me share this, but I, I'm done. <laughs>